Hello, everyone. Good evening, and thank you for joining us here. I'm Treasure Roberts, New Six reporter, and it has just been a wonderful day uh, for mental health. And I just want to introduce to you all the CEO and president of the Mental Health Association of Central Florida, Marnie Stallman. Thank you so much for joining us. Treasure, it's a pleasure to be here. It's been a long day, but it's been really, really exhilarating and rewarding, and um, we're really grateful for the team uh, to help us get some results. And we've been grateful for, for you and all of your team, your, your volunteers, the members, you all have been great. I've had the chance to uh, talk to you all throughout the day and just tell us mm -hmm. how long have you been here today? I know you are <laughs> tired. So I'm going on, I think this is hour 17. I got here at 4.45 uh, and I was up an hour before that. So yeah, but you know what? A little bit of sacrifice for a whole lot of results that make a difference in other people's lives. I can lose a few hours sleep over that and feel good about it. Mm -hmm. And the theme today is how are we doing? Central Florida, we are asking you how you're doing. And as some of the therapists here today said to me, this could not have come at a better time. Yeah. Would you agree with that, Marnie? Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And it's not just because, of course, the obvious of what's transpired in the last couple of days and the violence our community has experienced. But overall, Central Florida has really been for some time now really grappling uh, with its mental well-being. Uh, and so it's really incredible to see the resources devoted, uh, the amazing coverage and stories that have been highlighted and the various topics that intersect. And I, I hope what people take away from this is that um, just about every aspect of how we live intersects with our mental health. Mm -hmm. And Marnie, you are so dedicated, devoted, passionate. Just give us a little bit of background about you. Why did you sure. decide to take this route yeah. in life? Why do you wanna spend your time helping others with their mental health? Well, you know, um, I grew up here in Central Florida, graduate of Winter Park High School near over 40 years ago, go Wildcats. And um, this community is my home. It's where I've raised my family, my, my own daughter. Um, and it means something to me that we are still a big, small town. Um, I went into the social service fields to become a psychologist and a mental health counselor because I really had a desire to work with children and their families uh, and had been involved and have been involved with the Mental Health Association of Central Florida uh, since 1994. Wow. Um, yeah. Wow, long time. Thank you so much for sharing that. I do want our viewers to know we are so grateful that you tuned in today and we're hoping that something that someone said today, if they answered your phone call, if you watched a story, if it helped you out just a little bit. And I want you to know that the phone bank is still going. They've been going oh, just yeah. like Marnie since five this morning <laughs> and they will be going until 11. There they are. Tonight, look at them. They are working hard. <laughs> they are. They're working hard. So please call in. You still have time. You can see the number is on your screen at 888-436-6665. Please call in. We you also know what? Yeah, go ahead. And Treasure, I was going to say, we have a, a motto of sorts that our uh -huh. team goes by, which is anybody can answer the phone, but we answer the call. Okay, that's deep. How did you all start that? You know, it was just because the name of the program that this has been around that, that, will be, that people will be calling into uh, started in 1991. And it's called the Connections Program mm -hmm. um, because we want people to feel like they are connecting with somebody that cares about what is important and what can be um, life-saving and a difference maker in the people that are reaching out to us. And so it's not about just answering the phone call and delivering information back, but it's about connecting and um, meeting the individual caller where they are and finding out what they need. Thank you for sharing that. That's super interesting. And I definitely want to talk to you more about how you prepare the volunteers and the people who are picking yeah. up the phones. You can't just pick up the phone. So just give me one second. I want to dive right into that. But I do want to tell the viewers there is an opportunity for you to ask questions online as well. Even if it's not on the phone, if you don't feel comfortable picking up the phone and making a call, you can go to clickorlando.com slash mental health. Mm -hmm. um, you can drop your questions there. You can go to our live stream on YouTube. I'm waiting to see your questions pop up 
Um, and I also have some questions that I'll be asking throughout this uh, live chat tonight from some of our viewers who've already sent some in. But back to you on that, Marnie, you know, tell me how you prepare uh, the volunteers who took their time to come out today to pick up those phone calls, phone calls that could be heartbreaking phone calls that could make them mm -hmm. feel sad just listening to the stories uh, from people the issues that they're facing on a day-to-day -day basis yeah so every member of the connections team that is there uh, is there for an internship that um, is part of their master's program either through the university of central florida school of social work um, or the Rollins College um, School of Counseling. And um, so we've got people here that are um, really not endeavoring this for the first time, but they are um, wrapping up the, the end of their um, college experience and graduate experience. And this is kind of the capstone um, to do this. They're, they're with us for an entire semester. Um, we go through some extensive training with them before they ever get on uh, a phone call. And we have our team members who are part of our organization permanently that serve as mentors and supervisors. So no one's ever going to take a phone call by themselves. There's always going to be somebody right next door, right nearby to assist. So for example, in today's environment, um, I wasn't always on the call block for the phones being answered in the bank. I was in a, another station off camera so that if a call came in that was a crisis call, that was coming over to me. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank, thank you for that insight. I almost think, you know, like first impressions, as soon as you pick up that phone, that person on mm -hmm. the other end is going to decide if they want to continue talking to you. Mm -hmm. And your first impression yeah. could be everything, you know, they, that could keep them yep. on the phone with you. Sometimes the way that the referral will generate also, you've pointed out, sometimes it's a little bit scary to pick up the phone and have somebody hear your voice or disclose your name. It's even scarier in an online where somebody can see you. And so one of the other mechanisms of referral can be generated online by going to mhacf.org and going up to uh, generate a referral. And you can complete the same intake form that you would be asked on the phone online and then that's submitted and then a team member will respond back to you because um, we know it can be a little scary reaching out for that really first time it's really important definitely um and i do have a question over here and i think this is great because i know you all have so many resources that you are just itching to share uh, someone asked is there mental health groups that are free there are and we offer them so again, if you go to the Mental Health Association's website, mhacf.org, under events up at the top, you're going to see an event calendar. We run different support groups at different times of the week and month. So we have a sexual trauma support group. We have a grief support group. Um, we have a women's group that just started that is in um, Spanish because we know that we don't. Uh, we have a good community here in, um, in Central Florida, but um, English may not be their primary language, they, and so we've identified that. There's a number of different groups. They run at different times, and we're also open to new ideas about groups that the community may want to see. Um, Pre-pandemic, we ran an expressives art group, right? So this was an opportunity to come together uh, in person and through expressive art, uh, express how you were feeling and work through some issues. Some of the groups meet in person, but some of the groups also meet online virtually. Um, and what that's enabled us to do, Treasure, is we've got participants as far away as South America and England because wow. the internet is worldwide. And so they have found us and participate. And it's free, there's no cost, whether it's in person or virtual, and it's uh, an open door policy. So you mm -hmm. might wanna come and sit for a couple of weeks and then say, okay, I've camped out and now I'm moving on, but then maybe you want to come back. So there's no in and out. We don't keep attendance records. You come for what you need <laughs> yeah. and um, participate and make a deposit of who you are and make a withdrawal of what you need. And uh, yes, so you can go to that. There are other organizations in the community also offering support groups. Mm -hmm. And by calling the Connections programs, you can find those out from us and we can refer you to them. Wow, thank you for sharing that. And that was wide reaching that you said across overseas, there's, yeah. there's still services. Nice. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, that. this thing called the Internet winds up going just about <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> we love the Internet. Sometimes it can be bad, because, but sometimes it yeah. can be very good for connections. Yeah, um, it really can be. 
Yeah, and, and things like this, like I talked to a therapist earlier today um, and the, the day or age of COVID-19, lots of things yeah. have become virtual. So those people mm -hmm. who may not have been comfortable enough to come sit in a room with who some consider and may be a stranger, um, telling yeah. them all of their personal secrets, they may feel a little bit comfortable when there's a screen in between. Yeah, them. you know, we've talked about for the last three years, it's amazing coming up on March 8th, it'll be three years that we had the Central Florida official shutdown. Yeah. And what's really amazing is that there certainly have been horrible ramifications of what we all have experienced among them, detriments to our mental health. But there's also been some innovations. Mm -hmm. The utilization of telehealth and creating virtual opportunities for people to connect was something that really three years ago was just on the cusp. It hadn't been readily adopted and people were still a little suspicious of how it was gonna work. Now, especially with mental health, the adoption of a telehealth platform to meet and talk with the therapist has really opened up uh, an opportunity because we know, especially again here in Central Florida, when we talk and survey people about why they don't access mental health services, the chief um, reason is usually access to care. Mm -hmm. they, they don't know where to start and they mm -hmm. can't get there. Right. We have a we know we have a transportation uh, dilemma here in our community. And so this is a eradicated the idea that you have to get in your car to drive to see your uh, mental health provider. Mm -hmm. You can do it at home. You can be safe and secure in that. And you can still have really intimate transaction relationship with that mental health professional uh, to get you onto a road of recovery. And so from that standpoint, I've been a fan. And I have to admit in the beginning, maybe not so much, but I certainly, because I'm a little bit more old school, um, yeah. but certainly telehealth has really um, ignited, I think, and helped to open up avenues for people to gain access to mental health services and maybe help also to eradicate that idea of stigma mm -hmm. about reaching and getting service mm -hmm. and really normalizing that, yeah, I'm seeing my therapist today at two o'clock on a Zoom. Yeah. And I just, I love that we are evolving uh, with the times. And I do want to talk about stigma since you brought that up. It's a lot of times yeah. mental health, therapy, counseling, it has a bad stigma attached to it. And yep. I just want to know, why do you think that is? Well, I think, uh, it, gosh, that's just a big question. So let me start by saying that there's a difference between an individual that has a chronic mental illness and an individual that's having a mental health crisis. Mm -hmm. Chronic mental illnesses um, are neurologically brain-based diseases, bipolar, schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder. And unfortunately, those have been um, the ones that have been misrepresented in uh, movies and television. There's been this misperception and this perpetuation that when horrible acts of violence happen, it's from a crazy person. And so what and in, in truth, um, it's more likely that somebody with a chronic mental illness is going to be victimized by a violent act than be the victimizer. Mm -hmm. But it's easy to go there and just kind of use terminology that seems to blanket and cover this this whole category. And I think that's where stigma arises from because people think that they kind of get grouped together, uh, lumped in with the perception of, of somebody doing um, an evil act, um, perpetuating violence, and that that somehow is related to their to their crazy mental illness and it, and it's just not true so it it's been hard and it's also i think from a workforce standpoint again something that's being more normalized now um uh, it, it didn't and wasn't always safe to say that you were depressed or being treated for anxiety in your workplace because you were concerned how your employer may view mm. your potential to be productive Mm -hmm. um, to be a good employee and people would suffer really in silence and we've seen again over the maybe last year especially really uh, major corporate employers embrace accommodations and embrace the idea that within the workplace you can create safe space and you can create safe atmosphere um, for people who are managing a mental uh, health crisis or mental illness that's more chronic mm -hmm. um, and still see them as somebody that's a great contributor to the team uh, and and their work 
and their workplace. So mm-hmm. um, I think that's changing, but we still have a really long way to go. Yeah, really long really way do. to go. We're, we're making progress, but we got to keep taking those steps. So for men and for women, have you seen any sort of difference? Do you all have mm-hmm. any statistics or stats with your own association yeah. um, in regards to who seeks out therapy and counseling more? Yeah, and it's not just the stats that are coming out of from our organization. We're seeing it from Mental Health America, many of which you have been citing over the course of the day and many of the stories. Um, There's a lot of conversation and um, diligence in looking at this. There's definitely a difference between um, men and women seeking out services and mental health um, providers. Females seem to be more prone to um, be comfortable with it, whereas men don't seem to and then it crosses not just gender but it also crosses uh, culture and um, race Um, we know within um, certain communities um, it's not promoted to talk outside of your inner circle of your family um, that things stay internalized don't say that you're not doing well you know i think i heard somebody say a saying this week you know um pucker up buttercup, pull up your pants and act like a big girl, you know, kind of power through it instead of saying, I'm, I'm not doing well today. And so there certainly has been, um, and we've certainly seen two across age, um, particularly there is a crisis in that um, 11 to 17 year old category of um, while more females are, are being identified as being um, depressed and dealing with anxiety and self-harming behaviors. That's being reported back through emergency department visits that are doing risk assessments when they see these these kids come in. But among males, specifically African-American, Asian American and Hispanic, um, we're seeing a much, we're starting to see an incline and rise of suicidal completions Mm -hmm. Um, because those are three communities of color that haven't traditionally had resources um, provided. Um, there are lots of, you know, sociological um, reasons and things that we could talk for hours and hours about, about why those communities don't get support. Mm-hmm. Um, the different um levels of racism and bias that um, they experience and how that manifests and how they cope, the traumas uh, that they may have had to endure um, in earlier childhood. So all of that kind of brings into, you know, the question of, of when they grow and get older, um, how are they going to manifest the expression of, of that trauma mm-hmm. differently? And so there's a lot of attention, I think, about to be paid or should be paid. I know we're working on it, uh, yeah. particularly working in communities of color. Yeah, I actually spoke with uh, one of the therapists earlier about how their loved ones could suffer if, you know, say uh, an individual wants therapy, but their mm-hmm. parents or their siblings um, just simply don't believe in it and yeah. push them to do other things. Like, hey, you don't need therapy, just go take a nap power through yeah Yeah, power Power through through. push through it power through yeah or don't talk about it it's Mm -hmm. not even maybe don't power through don't Mm -hmm. talk about it it's fine you're going to be fine Mm -hmm. you're over dramatizing or Mm -hmm. um you're seeking sympathy seeking or attention getting and that so yeah things get buried and and suppressed and it can be deadly it can really be deadly and it can manifest itself um in ways that can be really harmful um, and life altering. And so for people who might be watching, uh, you might be listening and you feel like you want to vent, you want to talk about it. And people around you may not believe in therapy or venting. We do have a phone number on the screen. Our phone make again is running until 1130 tonight. Please take the time to pick up the phone and talk to somebody. It won't take long. Uh, they're here for you. The phone number is on your mm-hmm. screen. It's 888 888- Four three six 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 five. Please pick up the phone. You know, because as you said, people can suffer. As the therapist said earlier, people can suffer because of not what they believe, but what the people around them believe. 
Right. And what I'd like to say too, Treasurer, is even though that number is going to be live until 1130 tonight, the Mental Health Association has been here for 76 mm -hmm. years and we'll be back on Monday in our office. Yeah. So the same people that you see answering and talking on the phones through today are going to be the same people that are going to answer the phone starting Monday for the next 76 years. So if you miss the chance or are not feeling comfortable yet and you want some time to think about it over the weekend and kind of find some courage, we're going to be there on Monday morning and you can call in. Exactly. Thank you for telling them that because it does not end here. It does not end it doesn't. tonight. Um, thank you so much again for what you all do. Uh, your your mm -hmm. job, your devotion and dedication is really appreciated. Um, right, we do thank have, you. Yeah, we do have other questions um, Great. From, the, from the phone bank, actually. Wonderful. So someone said a loved one has been diagnosed with a mental illness, but they do not like their treatment or... Yeah. It is ineffective. So what are their mm -hmm. options in that case? Yeah, so that's unfortunately not um, something that's not unusual, right? We see that particularly with chronic illnesses like schizophrenia, um, we may not have individuals that are going to be given medications that um, are not the name brand. Right now, there's actually a bill going through the Florida legislature to stop this from happening. It's called Step Up. Mm -hmm. With major mental illnesses, um, there's a, what's called a formulary, which is kind of a list of medications to be prescribed. And generally speaking, insurance companies have been able to say, well, we're going to do the generic version of Wellbutrin, let's say. Um, and it's not as effective. And sometimes even with those medications, it will take a couple of weeks for it to enter your system and get to the maximum titration of what can be the effectiveness of the medication. So the bill coming through by Senator Harrell out of Tampa is to stop that step up process and allow um, individuals suffering from major um, psychiatric conditions to go right to the named brand. Um, and so that's one option is to first generic versus name brand. Mm -hmm. um, but we also see that for individuals that don't have health insurance um, versus somebody that does, they may not have options to get um, the same level of care or the same access of frequency of care. Uh, mm -hmm. And so that could be also something that we can assist with. We're really proud at the Mental Health Association that for the last um, 11 years in partnership with Advent Health and also Orange County government, we operate the only freestanding free and charitable clinic in the area specifically designed for people needing outpatient mental health counseling and also medications and they can come for as long as it's needed for free. Okay. Um, it's free for them. For us, we have to raise money mm -hmm. to help supplement that. Mm -hmm. But for the client, for the individual seeking the service, uh, they can call into the Connections program. We'll take the referral. We'll do some clinical intake about what the issues are that are presenting. And um, generally speaking, um, they're accepted as a patient at the Outlook Clinic also providing those services virtually or in person. Mm, okay. And I think since you talked about raising money to help others, this is the perfect time yeah. to tell our viewers <laughs> that you all are a nonprofit and that you yeah. are taking donations because help them help others. Tell them how that they uh, how they can donate. <laughs> Yeah, well, you can go to the website, uh, Mental Health Association or MHACF.org. I know we've got a QR code that's been utilized this evening and this afternoon. Um, you can call up or do it over the phone. Um, one of the things about the association that we like to help people understand is what's the value of X, then what does that equal? And so in just really brief terms, uh, a $25 donation once a month can help 10 up to 10 individual patients possibly wow. get the therapy or medications that they need. You wow. know, we want, you know, I was talking to somebody earlier and we said, we'd like to equate it to this. You know, if you have a Starbucks drink that you drink every day, <laughs> what's your favorite Frappuccino mm -hmm. or whatever it might be, and that <laughs> might cost you six to $8, skip it one day, mm -hmm. um, buy the generic, get some water, mm -hmm. uh, and instead um, make that a recurring $8 donation once a week um, for a year, and that can buy therapy for a dozen patients with medications. And that's wow. life saving. And so, yeah, Starbucks tastes good, but this is what it means to somebody that might not have health insurance. Mm -hmm. um, we pay for the medications, we sponsor the therapists that they're seeing um, because we know that access to care is so critical. 
Um, many times individuals that have a chronic mental illness, the reason they go into crisis is because they can't get their medications filled. Mm. Right. So we know that's so critically important. So we try to raise these contributions to help offset those costs. Um, we don't generate any revenue from any service that we provide out to the community, not our groups, not the connections program, uh, not the services at the Outlook Clinic. Everything that we do um, um, is no cost to the client or constituent that wants to access the care. Okay, that's lovely. And we have another question uh, from the phone bank, actually. What is the difference between treating a chronic mental illness <laughs> and a mental health crisis? Yeah, that's what we've kind of been alluding to and talking a little bit about. So as a, as I noted, a, a chronic mental illness can be described as bipolar disorder or schizophrenia or schizoaffective. Those are lifelong. They're managed mostly with medication and some outpatient therapy. Um, a crisis, a, a mental health crisis is something situational. It's short term. It could be that you're experiencing the loss of a loved one or uh, a breakup or even the loss of a job or, um, you know, witnessing a violent crime or being affected by a violent event in our community, like we've seen happen just in the last couple mm -hmm. of days, can put someone into a mental health crisis. Mm -hmm. It could be, um, you know, being harassed in the workplace is another example. But those are always um, considered to be short term. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes they can be assisted with medications. Um, sometimes medication is not necessary in a series or you know, weeks of talk therapy or group sessions online like we've talked about um, are enough to kind of right side somebody. And so um, it's kind of the difference between saying, you know, you have a, a diagnosis of high blood pressure or uh, cholesterol, that's something you're gonna have to manage mm -hmm. um, long term versus um, the flu, right, right? Which you take okay. short term and um, may um, have some medications and then it dissipates. Mm -hmm. um, and people that are in a mental health crisis, it's not unusual to see it recurring or get triggered. And you just have to be aware of that. Uh, have, your, have your resources in place, have the things that you know can help to lift you back onto a road of recovery mm -hmm. um, and um, utilize those. How do you know if something is triggering you? That's a great question. So um, my grandmother used to have a saying, which was you take yourself wherever you go which I always thought to mean, you know who you are, no matter what circumstance you find yourself in, what environment um, you are, you are who you are. And if you're in tune with that, you're going to know when you feel right, right? You're going to know just like when you eat something that's a comfort food, how that makes you feel warm inside versus something that you didn't like or didn't want to have to digest. And it's now, you know, made your stomach feel funny um, or your feeling foggy or you're not sleeping well and you used to be a pretty good sleeper or your food and eating habits have changed. Anything where you had a norm, a pattern of behavior and activity that was pretty much the same but has now started to be different. Um, sometimes you can see people become irritable and have outbursts when they were pretty calm most of the time, or they'll become overly emotional, or the opposite. You'll see people that maybe were a little bit more gregarious and outgoing with how they express themselves, and now they've just gone in, right? Um, and you just have to pay attention and um, know that that's not your best place, and um, reach out for somebody you trust uh, mm -hmm. that you can confide in, um, that can be kind of a safe lifeguard, if you will, and mm. then um, they can try to assist you. All right. And on the topic of lifeguards, <laughs> you did say that there are PSAs, a series of PSAs um, you all have been putting out. Tell me a bit about that. Yeah, so for our online community, if you're sitting in front of your community, your computer or on your phone, uh, check out youarealifeguard.org. This is a program that we created about a year and a half ago at the association to really focus on suicide prevention and the idea of creating a community of lifeguards that you can be for yourself, for a family member, for a colleague, um, for a close friend, and the premise behind it is that lifeguards aren't just for the pool. They're all around us mm -hmm. and you just have to spot one or be one. And it really doesn't take much for somebody to take the pledge to become a lifeguard. And really what that means is I'm checking in on you. Hey, are you okay today? 
And I think that that is just the simplest and uh, most divine fa- phrase that, that you can say to somebody, hey, are you okay? Mm. Um, sometimes you're going to go, oh, yeah, I'm going to be fine. You have to go maybe a little bit. Yeah. Dig, dig, dig for that mm. but sometimes you're going to get a really surprising answer like you know I'm hanging on by a thread I checked in on a friend today and I said hey I'm just checking on you because I hadn't checked in on them in a couple of days and I got back I'm hanging by a thread and my next response was I'm here what do you need and that's a lifeguard Saving so if lives, you go to you are a lifeguard water. yeah Exactly. So online at yourlifeguard.org, you can see some of those PSAs that we created. They've been running on social media platforms targeted to some of the age groups that we know are at risk. But more importantly, on the platform, you're going to find a wealth of information on suicide uh, resources and um, different groups that are meeting. And you know what, Treasure, I really want to say this because somebody asked me this just earlier today. It's okay to say the word suicide, Mm. saying that word doesn't make it happen. In fact, it's the opposite. We need to say it more often and identify that people are really uh, contemplating Mm -hmm. um, extreme measures to stop the pain that they're feeling. And if they just had somebody say, hey, you don't look okay, Uh, Okay. what do you need can be the difference. You know, and now that you mention that, when you just think about how long something, you know, how far something can go from saying something so short like Mm -hmm. are you okay just three words could change somebody's life I've actually been in um there was one time where I asked someone I didn't even know um I went I just a quick story I went to a skating ring and I rented my skates she happened to be (laughs) the owner of that uh, place and I had no idea. I just thought she was working there and I went up to the counter to get the skates and maybe get some nachos and I said, hi, how you doing? And a lot of times when we have that exchange, you expect, I'm doing good, how are you? And then yeah. you, you move on. Uh, you continue to just do what you came there to do because you maybe you weren't really thinking about how they were doing. And when I asked her how she was doing, she was ready to tell me how she was mm-hmm. doing and she just unloaded so many things it made me so sad um she told me she was on the brink of losing that skating rink that they had oh, opened wow. up and it had been open for decades she told mm-hmm. me that her husband uh, was on his deathbed and he had seizures he couldn't talk she told me you know her daughter was in a whole other state um, going through surgery so mm-hmm. all these things i feel like she just kind of kept bottled inside and What's interesting is you also never know who you're talking to and who's willing to help you. So I just so happened to be a journalist and she just had no idea. So I did what I could. I I told her story. I tried to solicit help for her and I tried to get to know her and at least comfort her. And I'm just so thankful that when I asked her how she was doing, I um, was open enough to really listen to what she had had to say instead of just going about my day. And that can happen at anywhere. any time, anywhere, with anybody. Um, mm-hmm. Even one of your volunteers told me today when I talked to her, all the calls that she took today and all the things that she heard, it just goes to show you, you never know what people mm-hmm. are going through. They might smile, they might you know, help you out, um, but you just never know what's going on behind closed doors. So that's, that's really important, um, the initiative. It's an amazing you, story, and thank mm-hmm. you for sharing that yeah. that lived experience that you had and mm-hmm. demonstrating that you were being a lifeguard, and that's the premise behind the whole program. And to your point about um, the volunteer talking about you never know, we really want to advise people and say, make sure you check in on the ones that look strong, mm-hmm. right? Yes. Because yes. it's more obvious when you see the one that's got their head down or they're mm-hmm. maybe being emotional or they've been out of the office or not in the workplace for a couple of days because they just not doing well. But it's mm-hmm. the ones that say, oh, I'm fine. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I'm good. Yeah. Those are the ones that you mm-hmm. have to really watch because they can be the ones that are sometimes the most vulnerable because of that stigma, because of that shame, because of that feeling of I can't show weakness. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. because if I show weak, then how will my colleagues view me or how will my family view me? So I've got to be strong or I can't afford to be emotional and um, vulnerable because I'm the one that carries the burden for the rest of everybody else. And if mm -hmm. I take time for myself, that's being selfish. Lots of really um, clear messages in there that can get really misinterpreted and distorted because mm -hmm. we're not thinking clearly. Uh, so the, we like to say in, in the community, check in on the strong ones yes. and say, and it's okay to say, you know, you said you were fine, but I want you to know that if you're not, it, I'm okay and safe to talk to. Maybe not now, maybe later, but I'll be here. And I'll it's good to just let people know that you are there for them. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I'm guilty of the I'm fine. So for all the viewers yeah. who might be the same way, you know, you're not alone. And as I try to tell people and mental health professionals say this too, um, it is okay, okay to not be not okay. Not be okay. Um, exactly. All, all the people who have yep. to be strong, it is okay to cry. If you don't want to cry in public, cry in the shower. You know, mm -hmm. it is okay to let those emotions out. So that was absolutely very important. I'm glad you touched on that. Um, so again, for people watching, don't be afraid to just ask someone, how are they doing? That's the theme for today. How are we doing? We have to ask each other that more because we're so yeah. laser focused on what's going on in our day and what's going on with us that we forget other people are going through things as well. Yep. And I'd like I'd yeah. like to just say this also as a point of that I was talking to one of our board members and counselors that was here that you were talking with earlier today. It takes really very little energy to be kind and a lot mm -hmm. of energy to not be. Mm -hmm. uh, and being kind just maybe means standing by and saying, I see you. Yeah. I see what you're going through. Mm -hmm. And um Maybe sharing a, a, an experience of your own and mm -hmm. saying, hey, you know how this looks? Well, guess what? This isn't fine, right? Yeah. And I want to yeah. tell you what's going on with me and yeah. showing that vulnerability. And sometimes we need to do that with our own kids. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much for sharing that. I do have another question uh, from the sure. phone bank. Um, someone said, a loved one is experiencing a mental health episode. There is concern that calling 911 could lead to a tragic outcome. Yeah. What should a family do? Who can they call? Should it be 911 or 988? Well, it depends. Um, but we're really fortunate uh, here in Central Florida that when we do call 911, right? So 911 is, you know, there's imminent risk, there's harm uh, that's possible, and, and you need assistance from a law enforcement uh, officer to come and assist you with that. Here in Orange County, uh, Seminole County, um, and across the state in different jurisdictions, we have something now called behavioral response units, which are code team responders of law enforcement officers and mental health counselors that dispatch together to try to de-escalate situations so that they don't have ramifications and poor outcomes that result in harm either to the to the team dispatching or law enforcement or worse to the individual that's having the crisis or their family member. Um, and so when you call in to 911, you can actually say this is a behavioral related emergency and the dispatch team has been trained mm -hmm. with the Orange County Sheriff's Office to dispatch a co-responding model with the counselors um, and law enforcement nearby if needed. Uh, okay. Same with City of Orlando. So 988, though, is really important to also talk about. And I know there were some stories earlier today featuring this. This is uh, the suicide crisis and prevention talk line that used to be the 1-800 number converted to this three digit back in July of this year across the country. And so when someone dials 988, um, they could be calling for themselves where they can have an opportunity to talk to a crisis counselor that can kind of hopefully depress the situation and calm things down. Or if you're a family member, lifeguard, saying, I think I know someone or someone's close to me that possibly is suicidal, that 988 will bring you um, to Catherine Ray's team, who was also featured today at Heart of Florida United Way. Um, and they'll dispatch mobile crisis teams, um, counselors, um, and professionals who are there to take the calls um, to help uh, the situations become uh, not as severe and hopefully uh, life-saving. Um, so 988 is always a great 
uh, fallback if you're not sure. And certainly we've seen um, when the 911 issue uh, has in the past been utilized, there have been some instances of violence and poor outcomes, but there's really been a lot of steps here in our community to mitigate that. Um, we cr congratulated um, just last year, um, we honored the city of Orlando's police department and also Sheriff Mina and his BRU unit for these efforts. Um, to make sure that law enforcement's involvement understood that people that are in a behavioral health crisis um, have special needs that need to be attended to and that need to be responded to differently. Okay, good. So that means either one is an option, ultimately. Absolutely. Okay, perfect. We're to... really fortunate in our community. Yeah, good. I want to transition to something um, that has been impacting so many of us here in Central Florida, I'm sure you're aware of the just devastating um, shootings that happened mm -hmm. just a couple days ago that took the lives yeah. of three people, uh, including a 38-year-old woman, a nine-year-old girl, girl, and a TV reporter, um, one mm -hmm. of our own journalism colleagues at Spectrum News 13, critically injured two others, um, yeah. including the daughters, the nine-year-old girl's mom, and uh, the photographer who was paired with a TV mm -hmm. reporter. Um, when tragedies like this happen, what is the first thing that you would want to tell the people who are directly impacted or the people who are indirectly impacted? They're just bystanders or they're just watching and hurting because of what's happening in their community. Um, reach out for professional help. Um, and don't hesitate because um, you might not realize it. You might have a delayed reaction or you might have an immediate reaction. You know, I had an immediate reaction. Um, I had people that I knew that were involved years, uh, several years ago with the Pulse shooting. Um, and so I immediately went to that place. And so there was triggering elements for me about what I experienced and the loss and grief. And I think as our community, particularly here because we did have the pulse shootings here, that we have a, almost a memory reflex of that violence and that um, piercing of our thoughts of safety and security in areas that we wouldn't have naturally thought um, would have violence come to them uh, in those environments. And so my first thing is don't hesitate. As you and I have been saying, it's okay to not be okay. And it's more importantly, it's okay to get help. And there are a lot of resources that the community has now embedded, ours included, um, but certainly not alone, that are there to provide trauma recovery. Um, because that's a whole nother different element um, for people that have been experienced or are exposed to a violent act. Um, different than a mental illness or a situational mental health crisis that causes depression. And for some individuals, that can be an immediate response. But for a lot of us, that's going to take weeks. Um, and it re-traumatizes um, us or brings back a trauma memory of an incident like Pulse, um, where our safety and, and perceptions of how and where we lived was, was pierced. Um, as now long, no longer being safe. And we have to have conversations with our kids, right? Because they have access to the information in a way uh, that's immediate and, and they should have these explanations about what happened and, and um, what they can do to restore, what we can do for them to restore sense of safety, sense of self, sense of community. Um, and, and work to really try to come up with solutions about why these incidences of violence keep occurring and how it's not and should not be normalized. Mm -hmm. And I want to know, does trauma truly impact the way that you move forward in life? So for those people who may have been in the area when this happened, whether they were TV reporters or neighbors, is it possible because of this that life just won't be the same for them? To some degrees, it depends, again, on the level of the trauma impact and what they fully experienced, whether it was residual or peripheral or whether it was direct um, and whether it was and is associated with other events that may have been equally traumatic at different points of their life. I've worked with um, different uh, gun related violent events violence events, um, talking with the survivors, the individuals that were 
um, a part of the uh, violence. And one shared that what triggered them was 25 years ago, they had a relative, you know, that was a victim of gun violence. And while they weren't killed, they were severely injured and permanently disabled. Um, and so that brought all that back up where they thought it had kind of been buried. It's, it's really a, um, depends on the person and it depends on how much work was done with the initial trauma and the current to make sure that it's understood that you um, don't distort, that there are opportunities to talk about, again, what your triggers are and, and why you're having those reactions and to be aware of what are coping strategies that can be developed so that you don't go to that place of fear and anxiety, but instead have it to be something that can be managed. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times when things like this happen, just senseless gun violence is carried out, taking lives, um, the first thought that comes to people's minds is this person was mentally ill. This person mm -hmm. who picked up this gun was mentally ill. What are, you thought, what are your thoughts about that? Well, I think unfortunately that helps to perpetrate the stigma. I, as we talked about earlier, I think, and, and when we first started this evening, that that's just not a true statement. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it's very, very rare for individuals who have mental illness to commit violent acts. Wow. Um, and in fact, as I said, it's it's more common for them to be the victim themselves than to be the victimizer. Mm -hmm. But it's an easy place to go because in our in our hearts and in our heads, we want to come up with an explanation for what is unexplainable. Oh, right? Oh, that must have happened because that that's just a crazy person, and right. we we don't want to have to grapple with the reality of what maybe was the real cause of why it happened. Um, what was the victimizer's real intent? What, what, mm -hmm. what was their story and what traumas did occur for them that caused them to get to this point mm -hmm. um, to perpetrate onto somebody else something so horrific as to take the life of a nine-year-old um, mm. little girl that was of no consequence or um, threat to, to the person that committed this act. Can you tell me more about uh, the statement you just made? You said that oftentimes they would be the victim and not the victimizer. Uh, why do mm -hmm. you say that? Well, because most individuals, a good portion of people that have a chronic mental illness um, are not going to be overtly violent. Um, they're, they actually internalize. They are mm -hmm. fearful themselves. Um, they sometimes self seclude. They're they're not usually the folks that you see out in the middle. You know, being involved. They t again possibly because of and probably because of stigma and how they're perceived. They they really kind of go internal, not not external. And so they're they're generally not somebody that you would find um, being willing to, to carry out an act like what we've seen happen just in the last couple of days. Mm -hmm. And even for yourself, we know that you are the CEO of this association. Um, you are divvying out tasks. You're making things happen. But you also have to pay attention to your mental health, right? You know, that's a great um, that's a great acknowledgement. And sometimes, you know, there's an old phrase. Uh, I'm come, I come from an Italian family. The shoemaker's son goes shoeless. Mm -hmm. You know, it's easy to put the shoes on the other people, mm -hmm. but you forget to put the shoes on yourself, right? <laughs> um, and so you're walking around with no shoes on, and that's not healthy either. And mm -hmm. you're right. And sometimes I'll take a mental health day. I might take one tomorrow. This has been really exhilarating, as I said, to be here. I've been on the phone taking calls. I've been here since almost you know, 4.30 this morning, I'll be here till 11.30 at night. And um, I can't imagine and think of any place I'd rather be. But I know the minute that I get in the car and I get home, I'm going to be emotionally and mentally and physically probably spent. And so I need to recharge. And we need to be aware of that about what gets depleted and how we rebuild that back up. Mm -hmm. um, and again, that's part of the check on the ones that look like they're the strong ones. Mm -hmm. Sometimes yes. the ones with the titles, the ones mm -hmm. that seem to be the decision makers, those are hard days sometimes to, to manage. So thanks for asking. Yeah, of course. How are we doing? That's the theme. So I definitely had to ask yeah. how you are doing. How are you doing? <laughs> you know, I am doing okay. Um, I, I will say 
it has been a rough week um, yeah. for myself, for my colleagues, for my colleagues outside of the station. Um, you know, we really had to just let it out um, a couple mm -hmm. days ago because sometimes we are the strong ones. Uh, we go out to the scenes that are horrifying. Um, and I know sometimes people might think, you know, we don't care, um, but I'll speak for myself. I care about these families that I go and talk to. You know, I try to stay composed because when they're telling me their stories that are just devastating. Um, yeah. I couldn't even imagine that happening in my own family. I try to hold those tears back and be strong for them. Mm -hmm. um, I don't mind interviewing people um, and then afterward giving them a hug or rubbing yeah. their back while they're, while they're talking to me, making people feel comfortable. Uh, but I will say when you take in so much tragedy and trauma from others, it's not like it, it doesn't stick to me sometimes. You know, it yeah. doesn't just go over my shoulders. I can't really dodge it. I'm taking this in each and every day or every week or every month or every year, all the sad stories. It's a depository, that's for sure. Exactly. So That you know, can get certainly filled up. Mm -hmm. So I have, to, I have to check on myself too. Sometimes I don't realize how much what happens to other people affects me and how you I know, and mm -hmm. That's a really good um, strategy, a coping strategy to think about and maybe send out to the folks that are listening and watching. Yeah. So on the days that you're doing really well and you got it together and you have your people that are your safety net, mm -hmm. say to them, listen, I'm doing good right now, really I am. But there's going to be a couple of days maybe that I'm not. And when yeah. I tell you that I am, push past that. I'm telling you now. So that when you get to that point and you're in that space where you're not functioning well and you're yeah. not being in a good emotional space and someone comes in and says, hey, are you okay? And you're like, yeah, yeah, I'm fine. And you want to move away. That's the signal to that person. That's like the code word. Hey, hey, you told me that you were going to say this. And I'm telling you, I see that you're not okay. Yeah. Um, so pre-plant, you can you can do some pre-planting yeah. um, with your safety team on that on that regard. And and to your point about you know, I was watching um, that evening uh, when uh, that night a few nights ago when this this horrific act first took place. And I remember thinking to myself that I was watching the reporters and I was watching the anchors. Uh, really emotionally trying to manage mm -hmm. um, how they were reacting to what they were reporting on. And then when the reporting segment was finished, they said, okay, and now we're going to go to weather. Yeah. And we're going to talk about the blizzard in California that mm -hmm. was going to happen. It was such a juxtaposition because professionally speaking for you all, you have to make that transition yeah. to move yeah. to weather. Um, and yeah. it was really remarkable to me. And I remember thinking to myself, that's courageous to be able to be in that vulnerable spot and talk about and exhibit what this is meaning to you as a community mm -hmm. and as a station and then say, okay, now we're going to have to go to weather. Yeah. Um, so it was, it, it was really interesting. I, I admire the courage that everybody that I've seen over the last two days we've been here um, really come together um, as a community, as a family um, as a station uh, mm -hmm. to support each other and that's yeah. what we have to do and something that I always think and I want to talk more about that too and, and as far as the transition and how the newscast looks when there's tragedies like that um, but a lot of times people think that it is weak to feel it is mm -hmm. weak to cry but I think that the people who are vulnerable are very strong because it takes strength to show emotion in a world that mm -hmm. tells you to have a straight Not face to. and push through it. Yeah. It takes strength to do that without feeling judged. Um, like, like you said earlier, like you're going to lose your job because you're not fit. So for the people who are vulnerable, I do believe that you are very strong and keep being vulnerable and tell people that is, oh, it is okay to be vulnerable. I'm telling you that to help myself as a person who often says, I don't want to cry. I don't like mm -hmm. crying. Please don't make me cry. I think I mentioned to you earlier, please don't say anything that makes me cry because I spent yeah. 10 minutes in a meeting yeah. here the other day crying. But it is okay. And I have to tell myself that. I just grew up in a household where it was just 
you know, very strong, push forward, keep going. We don't have time yeah. to feel. And I just took on that strong person, just mold. And I was always the strong friend. I was always the shoulder mm -hmm. to cry on. But whose shoulder was I crying on? Exactly. So as you mentioned, check on your friends. But back to the part about, you know, car compartmentalizing and how the anchors are trying to hold it together. The reporters are trying to hold it together but still have to be professional. You yeah. know, that does take a lot. I, I teared up watching. It's a courageous anchors. act. Ex exactly. I teared up watching my anchors try to hold it in. They, they mm -hmm. want to be professional and they want to be poised, but I think sometimes people forget that we are human. And although people might think that we are robots and we just get up there and we just read or we just put our stories together and leave, we do also feel with you, feel for you. Um, and that's what you could see if you watch our newscast on that horrible evening, uh, our anchor, you know, Ginger, Lisa, they're yeah. talking and they're choked up, you know, they, yeah. because they feel they have hearts. Um, but it, it definitely is hard to try to push forward and do your job because at the end of the day, we do have a job to give people the information. Um, and it's tough sometimes because you have to have that balance. You do. And it's hard maybe to find that balance internally when you're in turmoil. Yes. Um, and, yes. and all of the things that, as you've pointed out, come to bear mm -hmm. to, to get you to that point. And yeah. I think that's one of the things that makes the hallmark of what makes a good, at least for me as a viewer and as a community member, what makes a good station, what makes a good reporter is their ability to demonstrate that while they can definitely be poised and professional, they can also be compassionate and yes. empathetic mm -hmm. and that they can connect um, with the person that they're trying to tell the story on um, and bring that forward. And there's definitely um, a talent here in, in the community of, I would think we're fortunate um, a, across the spectrum to see uh, a lot of people that have that ability and that talent, mm -hmm. but you can certainly see it when it's not there. Uh, and I think our community is grateful to see um, all of what has taken place here and, and across uh, at other stations as well, um, how they have risen to that point of professionalism and poise, but also compassion and empathy. Yeah, definitely. I hope people listening are marinating on that word empathy, that word compassion. We have to have it for ourselves and for others. Mm -hmm. And. Barney, I just want to thank you and the entire team, uh, the Mental Health Association of Central Florida, for what you've been doing since 5 a.m. this morning <laughs> and will be doing after we end this web chat. Um, what time yeah, is it? It's, it's, I don't even know at this point. It's 5 o'clock <laughs> somewhere, right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So thank you so much, everybody who tuned thank you. in. This has been awesome. This could not have come at a better time, but I do want to let you all know it is not over yet. We might be leaving your screen here in just a few that's minutes, right. but the phone banks are still running. You can see on your screen, that's the phone number. Please take the time to pick up the phone and call. You never know how we could change your life. Uh, the number is 888-436-6665. Please go ahead. And don't forget when that number goes mm -hmm. away tonight, we'll still be there Monday morning. Exactly. It does not end here. Um, again, it's how are beginning. you doing? I hope you're doing good, everybody. And if you're not, that is okay. Thanks so much for joining us. And thank you, Marnie. Thank you. Thank Bye, everybody. you.